Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants adventure. Uh, my name is Joe Grabowski, and for those who don't know, we're all about bringing science, adventure, and conservation to classrooms, uh, North America and beyond. And uh, couldn't be more excited uh, to introduce our guest today, Roz Savage. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a background, and then uh, we'll let Roz take over because she's got the good stuff today. So, uh, Roz was the first woman to row solo across the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. She holds several uh, world records. She's rowed over 15,000 miles, um, over 500 days on the ocean in a 23-foot rowboat. She's a United Nations climate hero, a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, fellow of the Explorers Club, and in 2010, she was uh, Adventure of the Year, National Geographic's Adventure of the Year. Um, she uses her ocean rowing adventures to inspire action um, for people in sports, um, as well as uh, environmental challenges facing our world today. So Roz is very involved in that. Roz, it's great to see you today. So excited Such to be connected with you. Such a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. Well, um, yeah, you're in the UK. We've got classes from Canada, or sorry, from the United States joining us today. I'm broadcasting from Canada, so we have a nice little um, grouping. Yeah, it's fantastic. Hi, everybody. I'll turn some mics on so they can say hi. hi. <laughs> that is such a lovely welcome. Thank you. Um, so um, I have a funny accent because I'm British, but I hope that everybody can understand me OK. Um, I'm going to just talk to you for a few minutes, well, about 20, 25 minutes. And then I'd be really happy to take questions um, after I've stopped talking, so let's do it that way around. Um, I've got a little slideshow ready for you today, so I am just going to fire that up right now, and um, we're going to kick off with a... Joe, I can't get this to work. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so it should be the green button on the side, the share screen. Yep. Am I sharing my screen now? Uh, not yet. You know, I love technology when it works. <laughs> I'm sure but we can get it. It just worked a minute ago. It did, yeah. Okay, so we're going to go to entire screen, share, and then we're going to go over to my video. So There's me. It worked. Is that all good? It's good. We got it. Brilliant. Okay. So I'm just uh, to give you a quick flavor of what it's like to row across an ocean. I'm going to show you a really short video, it's two or three minutes, from my first ever ocean crossing. So this is the Atlantic, and I am having a really bad hair day on the ocean. Here we go. My right shoulder blade was giving me serious jip. It was a bit of pain with the shoulder and stuff. Not when I cross the My bum is really sore. Just keep going, just keep rowing. It's the trouble with oceans. It seems to be always not enough of something or too much of it.
absolute dead calm. And this is choppy compared with what it was like first thing. The wind is pushing me south. It's being pushed north. We're now south of Antigua, more south. <laughs> I'm weary and I've been out here for too long and I can't get on the phone to have a whinge to anybody else. Very, very hard going. Oh my god, but it's going to be hard. A strong urge just to curl up in my bunk. <laughs> Tired, pissed off, sore. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough to take. <laughs> So looking at that video, you might imagine that, uh, that I'm courageous <laughs> in some way, but I'm absolutely not. When I was your age, I wasn't even very sporty. I was one of those rather uncoordinated kids that couldn't catch and couldn't throw, and nobody really wanted to have me on their team in physical education. They certainly would never have guessed that in the future I would be rowing solo across oceans and, and neither did I. So what I'd like to talk to you about today is how I learned to be courageous and how I managed to keep on going when the going got really tough. And the reason that I was showing you this little map here is showing you how tough the going could get. You see the, the red line, that's where I'm trying to go, but you see the winds and the currents are, are pushing me around all over the place. and that all gets pretty challenging. For me, the first step on my journey towards courage was getting really clear, was getting this incredible clarity about what it was that I wanted to do. I'd become really concerned about our environmental challenges and wanted to do something to bring people's attention to it. And so when I had this crazy idea to row across oceans and use that as my way of getting people's attention so that I could talk to them about our environmental issues. It just seemed to make perfect sense to me. So I got out my charts and my compass and figured out that I was going to row across these three oceans, the Atlantic, the Pacific and the Indian. The next step on my way to courage was that I really took ownership of this project and you should know at this point that I had like a proper grown-ups job before I decided to be an adventurer. I used to work in an office in the City of London, you can see our, our London red buses in this picture. I was just a normal person getting up in the morning, going to work in the office cubicle and then coming home at the end of a long day and repeating that every day of the work week. And when I worked in the office, to be really honest, I never really cared all that much about what I did. I never really owned the work that I was doing. My boss would give me a job to do and I would do it because my paycheck depended on it. But it never, I never really took it to heart. It wasn't really important to me. I was just doing this job I didn't like, generally to buy stuff that I didn't need. And by contrast with that, when I decided I was going to row across these oceans, I was terrified, but yet really excited at the same time. I was just so certain that this was what I wanted to do with the next few years of my life. And so I set about preparing for that first voyage across the Atlantic. And something really cool happens when you get really clear about what you want to do is that you just start letting go of any of the stuff that's cluttering up your life. I call this my uncluttering phase. So I got rid of any possessions that I didn't need anymore that I wasn't going to be taking with me on the boat. I also got rid of any tasks that weren't going to help me. 
and there were some people, some friends, who didn't think that I was going to be able to do this. They were sort of negative. I felt like they were dragging me down, so I'm afraid that I had to let those friends go too. I just wanted to be surrounded by positive people who believed in me and thought that I could make my dream come true. And I, I think of this as being a bit like uh, scrubbing the barnacles off my boat. So this is a photograph of the bottom of my boat um, during the Pacific crossing. And you can see these uh, strange shells growing on it. These are gooseneck barnacles. And it was one of my absolute least favorite jobs that from time to time I would have to jump over the side of the boat. I'd have a good look first, make sure that there weren't any sharks down there. And then I would jump over the side with my scraper and have to scrub away at these barnacles, get rid of them, because if I didn't, they would just grow bigger and bigger and create more and more drag and slow me down more and more, stopping me from getting to where I wanted to go. And so those unhelpful friends or that stuff I didn't need or the tasks that weren't helping me to get across the ocean, those were like these barnacles that I had to scrub off the bottom of my boat. And one of the most important things for me was feeling that what I was doing actually mattered to other people. And I call this the, the relatedness. It was knowing that this environmental mission that I was on, it wasn't just about me. It was actually trying to do some good in the world. And it was really wonderful how excited people would get when they heard what I was about to do. And I'd like to share a particular story about this gentleman whose name is Len. And behind Len, you can see the boatyard where we were getting my boat ready for the Atlantic crossing. And it faced onto the main street of the little village where I was living at the time. And every day, Len, who I suppose was retired from work and didn't have all that much to do with his time, Len would pop in to see how it was all going. And it was a bit of a mixed blessing because I had lots to do to get the boat ready and it was sometimes a little tiny bit annoying to have to stop work and chat with Len. But at the same time, it was really lovely that he cared so much. And I remember on the final day when we were loading up the boat onto the trailer, ready to be transported down to the start of the race. And Len came by and he gave me this rather lovely present. It was a glass tankard with a beautiful engraving on it of a sailboat. And I was really touched and I said, oh Len, that's so kind of you. You shouldn't have. And he said, oh don't worry love, I didn't. They were giving them out free in the bar down the road. But uh, whether it was free or not, it was very lovely to know that people actually cared about my fate out there and whether I was going to succeed. And I know that the guys in the boatyard had a, a map up in their coffee break room and every day they would update it following my progress across the Atlantic. So after over a year of planning, at last the date for the start of the race arrived. And this is really the scary bit. I mean, it's easy to plan projects, but then at some point you've actually got to set out there and take action. And the reason this is scary is because you're actually pushing out from the shore, heading out into the big waves, out into the big wide ocean, knowing that you're not going to see anybody for months until you get to the other side. And as I set out from that little marina in the Canaries to row 3,000 miles across the Atlantic. Um, I think that's about the distance from New York to San Diego, but maybe your teachers can correct me if I'm wrong. It's a really long way. And as I took those first few oar strokes, I was wondering just how many hundreds of thousands, maybe even a million oar strokes lay ahead of me. And I have to say, it didn't get off to a very good start. Um, the first night I spent out on the ocean with my boat rolling around in these big waves, I was absolutely scared stupid. 
it didn't help. I was also being horribly seasick and having to run outside of my cabin to throw up over the side of the boat. I really was thinking, oh my word, what have I done? <laughs> I don't have what it takes. Do I have the right stuff? I, I don't know if I can tackle a big adventure like this and make it succeed. I'm not sure that this was a really great decision. Maybe I can still turn around and row back. And yet I was just stubborn enough to hang on in there. I realized early on that I needed to find a way of measuring my progress that was going to encourage me. And uh, I did this the wrong way first. There was a little data field on this, this screen that you see that's, that was telling me that at my present speed it was going to take me about two years to get to my destination. I sincerely hoped that that wasn't going to turn out to be true. And in the end I had to reprogram this thing so that it didn't depress me quite so much. And instead I wrote up, uh, this is from the Pacific, I wrote up the numbers for the lines of longitude that I was going to have to cross to get to my destination. And that, that worked much better for me. One of my favorite words is grit. You know what I mean by grit? It's that sort of determination and tenacity and the stick to itiveness that keeps you going when you really just want to give up and stop. And I also like the me meaning of grit um, that's like a little grain of sand, you know, like a, a bit of dirt. That, uh, do you know about this? That when a bit of grit gets into an oyster's shell, it really irritates the oyster. It's kind of tickly and itchy and annoying. And so what the oyster does is that it covers the bit of grit in pearl. It creates, out of this irritating thing, this beautiful pearl. And that's what I felt happened to me on the ocean. That all of the things that I was really struggling with, the seasickness and the, the saltwater sores and the pain in my shoulders and the blisters on my hands, all of those things that were really irritating me, eventually turned into beautiful things. They helped me to build my character and build my courage and turn into a stronger person. I did discover the joys of scream therapy. I don't suggest that you do this in the classroom. I don't think your teachers would like it very much. But when I was getting really frustrated, sometimes it really helped just to absolutely bellow at the ocean, just to let out all of my stress. Um, and don't do it at home either. And it also helped that I was able to talk to my mum from time to time, just to share my troubles with her. And uh, even though she hadn't really wanted me to do this, uh, this big adventure, she was so understanding when I was out there until my phone broke at the end and then it was terrible for both of us because my mum didn't know how I was doing and I didn't have anybody to talk to about just how tough it was. And I think sometimes courage is just as simple as finding the willpower to keep showing up day after day and keep sticking your oars in the water. I was rowing for about 12 hours a day and it was really, really hard work. And it was often very boring and sometimes it was absolutely terrifying. But I think it's a very important thing that maybe, you know, sometimes when you watch a, a Hollywood movie and it seems like success is a really quick and easy thing, that it happens almost overnight. But in my view, the success that's most worth having is the kind of success that you've really had to work hard for, where you've put in the blood and the sweat and the tears just to, to keep showing up, to keep on going. And that's the most worthwhile in the end. So at last, after three and a half months at sea, I finally made it into the tiny little island of Antigua in the Caribbean. And it was absolutely the best feeling of my life. I'll show you some pictures of how that felt. I was just grinning from ear to ear. I was on cloud nine. And I really believe that the size of the sense of achievement is directly in proportion to how hard you've had to work to get there. Um, those were photos of me with my, my lovely mum who'd come out to greet me in. 
it was absolutely the best feeling of my whole life. And maybe you know what that feels like when you've had a big school project or or you've been training hard for a race or you've been doing a big handicraft project at home and it's taken you ages and there have been times when you've wanted to give up but you've you stuck with it. You've carried on trying. It really does feel great when you achieve the thing that means so much to you. So you might have noticed that if you take the first letter of each of these words that we're we're building up another word. Can you see it? We're building up to courage. And so we need one more letter to finish it off. We need an E. And for me, that E stands for evolution. But when I arrived in Antigua, I thought, I've learned so much. I've got to know myself so much better. I've really pushed my limits. I've got out of my comfort zone. Now, what can I do with that? How can I take what I've learned and evolve it onto the next level. And so I turned it into this process of continuous improvement. And over the course of the Pacific and the Indian Oceans, I got better and better and better at rowing across oceans, better at managing my own thoughts. And I even eventually got to enjoy the experience. And um, these, this is the map of my route across those three oceans. Didn't row around the whole world, but I managed a pretty fair chunk of it. And I'd just like to, um, to share a final quote with you, which really is about this idea of getting outside of your comfort zone, about really pushing yourself beyond your limits, that you don't discover what you're really capable of until you've pushed yourself out there. And um, you might want to talk about this afterwards, that you don't discover new lands without losing sight of the shore. And losing sight of the shore is scary. It feels very unnatural to be rowing away from land. It can feel very unnatural to be pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. But take it from me, that's where the magic is. That's where the cool stuff happens. So in just a moment, um, we're going to go to Q&A, but I just finally want to share another short video with you. This is all the good bits. This is uh, the arrivals on dry land at the end of the Atlantic crossing and then the three stages across the Pacific. And I want to share this with you just so that you see how, how good it feels when you accomplish that big scary goal. Here we go.
There we go. Hi, everybody. Ross, thanks so much. That was amazing. First of all, the story, and then sharing with us uh, your steps, that pathway to courage. I think that's something, as a teacher, I know for sure that my students could use, and I bet you it's a great pathway for students watching today to follow. That was so cool. Thanks, Roz. Oh, you're very welcome. I do feel courage is such an important thing for everybody in the world right now, and, you know, we live in really interesting times, and sometimes it takes courage to question the way that things have always been done and to think independently about is there a better way to do things, a better way to be happy or a better way to accomplish this this goal and it's it takes courage to do things differently so I think no matter what age we are it's important. Alright well let's get to some questions I'm going to introduce the four classrooms quickly and we'll give them a chance to say a quick hi and then we'll grab some of their questions. Sounds good. So first, we have Miss Capone's fifth graders in New Jersey, if you guys want to say hi. Hi! There they are. Uh, we've got Mrs. Barry's group from Weatherford, Texas. They're good to see you. Uh, Mr. Greenfield's grade fives in New Jersey. How's it going, guys? All right, then we've got some grade sixes uh, with Mrs. Obergen in San Antonio, Texas. How's it going? <laughs> All right, so we've got a great group. Let's start right away with those grade sixes in uh, San Antonio. Do you guys have a couple questions for Roz? Yes. Yes, Eddie. Yes. Hi, my name is Kaylee Otto. Hi, Kelly. And my question is, are there any people who ever uh, protest against what you're doing to help the Earth? Do people protest against what I'm doing? Mm-hmm. Oh, um, not that I'm aware of. What kind of people are you thinking of? I don't know. <laughs> Just, I was wondering if anybody protests against you. I had a bit of a bad time when I had a failed attempt on the Pacific. Um, and, you know, sometimes when there's someone trying to do something really out of the ordinary and then they fail at it, some people get really negative about that because I think it makes them feel better about never even having tried. So they were pretty mean to me, actually. And I had to toughen up a bit and really look into my heart and know that I was doing my best and doing the right things for the right reasons and if they didn't understand me well that was their problem and not mine. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else in San Antonio got a question for me while we're here? Oh loads of hands going up. Hi I'm Madison. Hi Madison. And my question is uh, what type of animals did you see when you were uh, crossing the ocean? Oh, I saw some lovely animals. I saw dolphins and I saw whales. The whales were nice because they would, you know how they spout air and water out of their heads. You can't really miss it when a whale is close to you because it smells really fishy when it does that. And so they'd come up close to the boat and spout and then I, I would know they were there. Um, and I saw birds almost every day. It's amazing how many birds live even right out in the middle of the ocean. They spend their whole lives out there. 
Um, but my favourites were the turtles. And I didn't see them very often, but um, turtles are just my favourite creatures of all. They were really cute. And they would come right up to the boat and just swim around and check me out and say hi. And it really felt like I had a bit of company for a while. And yes, I would talk to them. They didn't tend to talk back very much, but it was nice to pretend. All right. Well, let's jump over to Mrs. Capone's class in New Jersey. Your mic's on. Hello, Mrs. Capone's class. Oh, hi. Hi, my name is Paige. And hi, Paige. My class thinks you're an inspiration. And my question is, do you have any other trips planned? I don't have any other trips planned. I really, I did what I set out to do. And by the time I finished The Last Ocean, I'd been at, at sea on the Indian for five months without seeing dry land, without seeing another human being. And I thought, I think I've really done this. Like I've learned everything that I can learn in this rowboat, and it's time that I did something different. So I'm very happily retired from ocean rowing now, but I hope that I always keep challenging myself Maybe not physical challenges in the future, but want to keep pushing that comfort zone one way or another. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. Hi, my name is Carrie. Hi, Carrie. How are you? And I was wondering how long you stayed at one island. How long did I stay at an island? Well, um, when I was rowing across the Pacific and I stopped in Hawaii and in Tarawa, I actually wanted to spend the winter on dry land um, because I didn't want to be out in the ocean during any winter storms. So um, I didn't spend all of the time in Hawaii. I had to come home and see my mother. Um, but I, I was on land for about, mm, about eight months in between voyages. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Christian. Hi, Christian. I was wondering, when you got home, what was the first thing that you did and what did you miss the most on your voyage? Oh, well, it's kind of the same answer to both of those. Um, I had a really, really long hot shower. <laughs> it felt really great because I'd been using cold water in a bucket with a sponge to wash myself while I was on the ocean. and. You know, it's, it's okay when it's all you've got, but um, when I arrived in Antigua, I think I spent about three quarters of an hour just in the shower. It was, I mean, you couldn't eat, there was so much steam in there, you couldn't even see anything by the time I'd finished, but it felt absolutely wonderful and to have white fluffy towels instead of a rather salty towel that I'd had on the ocean. So that was really nice. It was also really nice to have a cold drink because on the boat everything was room temperature, nothing was either hot or cold. And so having a really nice icy cold drink was lovely. What would be the first thing you would do? Mm. I'd probably sleep in. <laughs> <laughs> I did that too, yes, after the shower. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Christian. All right, great questions. Let's jump to Weatherford, Texas, to our grade threes. <laughs> How long have you traveled? How long have I traveled? Well, I spent a total of about 520 days at sea, and the longest single voyage was five months exactly. So, for example, so today is the 10th of February. So, five months today from today would be what? February, March, April, May, June. Be like past Independence Day by the time I got back to dry land. So that is a, a really long time to be out at sea on your own, isn't it? Can I ask my question? Hi, my name is Ava. Hi, Ava. And I am one. My question is Have you even run into bad weather? Oh, yeah, I've run into really bad weather. Um, and. Um, it was so bad that it capsized my boat. Like the boat went right over. Wow. And, um, unfortunately, I was in the cab. I mean, I've done this. It's happened a lot of times. And the boat is designed to come the right way up again when it capsizes. But it's, it's still not very much fun. If you can imagine being inside a washing machine and the washing machine's going around and you're just like tumbling around like a doll inside it, 
that's a bit how it feels to be inside a capsizing boat. So I don't particularly recommend it as a fun way to spend a night. You don't get very much sleep. Okay. All right. If there's one more question, we'll snag it. Otherwise, we'll move to our other class in New Jersey. You guys have another one? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Natalie. My question is that um, had um, like, had you ever like, had you ever hit an animal with your boat or like? been attacked or something? Oh. <laughs> like a shark? I've never been attacked, so I'm very happy to say. Um, the turtles would come and bang their shells against my boat. I wasn't running into them, they were running into me. Um, but that was quite good because it, it let me know that they were there because otherwise it would be quite easy to miss them because they're so low in the water. Um, oh, and an another really cool thing that I saw was a whale shark. Um, they're not scary sharks because they're filter feeders. They, they don't have big teeth like jaws. And um, they can grow up to 50 feet long, which is huge. I mean, that's probably bigger than your classroom. Um, but this one was just a baby. It was about eight feet long. And it came right up to my boat and spent about half an hour just swimming round and round the boat. It was really, really cool. That was very exciting. But yeah, it's it's always good seeing wildlife. I've never felt scared of it. It's um, it's always just put a big smile on my face. Amazing, very cool, uh, Mr. Greenfield. Your mic is on. Hi, Mr. Greenfield. Has anybody got a question? Hi, my name is Alexis. Hi, Alexis. Um. How do you pack your equipment in a very small canoe across the ocean? <laughs> really carefully. Actually, you'd be surprised how much room there is in the boat because it looks really small when it's in the water, but it's actually quite a lot of the boat is underneath the water. So there's plenty of room down there for me to pack enough food for up to five months at sea. And I also had to take a really big first aid kit in case I had any medical problems and a really big tool kit to mend things when they broke. So, um, yeah, I just tried to pack it. The other really important thing about packing is remembering where you put everything, because it can drive you absolutely crazy if you know you've got something on board and you're looking for the compartment and you can't find it anywhere. So I had to be very, very organized about where I put everything. Hi, my name is Justin. What's the hardest part of rowing across major ocean water when there is no stops in the ocean? What's the hardest part? Um, I think the hardest part for me was just dealing with my own thoughts because sometimes I got quite sort of, I wouldn't say depressed, but you know, quite, I was struggling out there and um, my thoughts were sort of going down this spiral and I had to find a way to cheer myself up because there was nobody else to cheer me up or make me laugh. And um, so I had to try and find a way to look at the situation in a way that made me feel more positive about it. And I think one of the most important things I learned about taking on a really, really big challenge is just to take it one day at a time. Like if you look at the whole challenge, I don't know if you ever feel like this when you look at the whole semester ahead of you, if you feel a bit intimidated by how much, how much work you're going to have to do. Um, for me, the most important thing to learn was really just take it a little bit at a time. It's all about baby steps, but keeping the baby steps going consistently in the right direction. Does that make sense? Oh. Okay, let's grab one more question from uh, this class. Hi, my name is Courtney. Hi, Courtney. Um, when you got to the island, did you have to go all the way home? Did I have to go all the way home? Oh, what you mean, like row home? <laughs> no, I, I cheated. I took the plane. It seems a lot easier. <laughs> it takes a really long time to row anywhere. <laughs> all right, well, I'm going to slip back to our San Antonio class because um, they only had two questions at the beginning, so I'll give them a chance to have the final wrap-up question if they'd like it. So I'll turn that on. Our grade sixes, there we go. Okay, um, my name is Joseph Richards. Hi there. Hi, Joseph. And I wanted to know, 
what did you eat and drink, and if you ever caught any fish or anything like that? To eat? Um, I so I'll tackle the drinking question first. Um, I had a water maker on board that could take seawater and turn it into fresh water by um, a process called reverse osmosis. So um, it was a, an electrical piece of equipment powered by solar panels. So that's how I got my water. Um, my food, I took, um, if you ever had a freeze-dried meal, like when you go hiking or camping or something like that, where you just add boiling water to it. And, you know, they're not great, but they're okay. You can live on them. I ate quite a lot of those. I also, um, I love Lara bars. Do you know the Lara bars? They're like fruit and nut bars. They make them in Colorado. And um, they sponsored me. And I've eaten thousands of Lara bars over the years. And that they were really good. And I also, I had a little sprouting pot. I actually grew my own bean sprouts on board so that I could have fresh vegetables. Oh, and for a treat, I did have chocolate, which was really good. Um, so I actually, apart from the chocolate, everything else was really quite healthy. And you asked if I caught any fish. Um, I never actually tried fishing. I must admit, I was a little bit squeamish about having to like hit the fish on the head to kill it, and then having to like cut it open and pull all its guts out. So um, I was I was a bit of a wimp about that, really. But occasionally, a fish would land on board, and if there was enough, um, most of them were really skinny fish. There wasn't really anything any flesh on them. But uh, just once, I did have a fish that landed that was worth eating. But um, it was gone in about two mouthfuls, so I, <laughs> I don't think that would have kept me going for very long. Um, but I eat, I eat pretty healthily. It's, um, it's also a great way to lose 25 pounds. If, I mean, not that any of you ever need to, but um, it's, uh, you get lots of fresh air and exercise, and I always felt really, really super healthy by the time I got to the other side. All right. Well, great questions from all the classrooms joining in today. and. Um, again, Roz, it was a great uh, for you to share your journey through Courage with us. And maybe just before we wrap up, maybe I'll give you a chance if you want to leave the classes with a message or maybe a little bit of advice for tackling a challenge or a risk in the school year, maybe. Yeah. Um, what would I say? Um, I would, coming back to the theme of courage, um, I would say what enabled me to find my courage was just getting really passionate, really excited about something that really meant a lot to me. For me, that was the environment. For you, it, it might be something completely different. It might be um, some ill or disabled people that you know that, that you really, really want to help. Uh, or, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you've all got things that you really care about, whether it's about animals or, you know, just think of your own thing. But what I found was that when I cared so much about something, I found all of these strengths inside of myself that I hadn't known were there before. And there's something really special, really, that gives you so much energy when you just care passionately about something. So if you can find the thing that you really care about, you'll be amazed what you're capable of. All right, that's some great advice. Um, I'm going to turn on the microphones of our classrooms, and we're going to give them a chance to say goodbye and thank you, and then we'll we'll sign off today. So again, Roz, thank you so much. I had a lot of fun. I know the classrooms did. I um, certainly did too. Thank you. All right. Here go the microphones if you guys want to say goodbye. <laughs> that was fantastic. Bye, everybody. Right. Thank you so much. We are signing off. Pleasure. All right. See you soon.